My name is Francesca Buriani and I'm here to chair this second session, um, which is dedicated to uh, modern early women's uh, writing and their relationship to Hermeticism, the first part, and the second part to uh, Francis Yates as an inspired historian. And in particular, I suppose, um, about you know, the history of Hermeticism, in a way, of her review of Hermeticism. So I'm, I'm very aware of the time constraints, so I think we should allow the speaker to speak one after the other, and then we'll take questions at the end. So the first uh, speaker is Sajed Chaudhry, who I pronounce the way in the name correctly. And uh, Sajid is post postdoctoral researcher at the National University of Ireland, Galway, where he's working on the ERC-founded project, The Reception and Circulation of Early Modern Women's Writing, 1550 to 1700. He has published articles in the journals Textual Cultures and Women's Writing, and is currently working on a monograph on early modern women and alchemical poetry. The title of his paper today is Renaissance Hermeticism and Women. We look forward to that and to hear about your research. Thank you. In her seminal study, Giordani Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, Francis Yates argues that during the Renaissance, the mythical Egyptian sage Hermes Trismegistus was regarded as a real philosopher, priest, physician, and alchemist who had lived at the time of Moses and conceived through divine revelation the works of the wisdom texts, the Hermetica. His works gained considerable influence from Marsilio Ficino's Latin translations of the Hermetica, which went, went through more than 20 printed editions between 1471 and the mid-16th century and were translated into French, Spanish, Dutch, and Italian. The first printed English translation of the Hermetica was John Everard's The Divine Pomander of Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus of 1649. Yeats suggests that the Hermetica and Hermetic alchemy provide illuminating context for understanding the philosophical traditions drawn on by several Renaissance male writers, including Giordani Bruno, Marsilio Ficino, Robert Flood, and Henry Moore. Building on Yeats's groundbreaking scholarship, this paper proposes that Hermes Trismegistus, the Hermetica, and Hermetic Alchemy were key influences on the writings of some Renaissance women. I argue that 16th and 17th century women in France and England obtained access to Hermetic texts and practices through their male contemporaries and used what they found there to inform their own spiritual, medical, and textual practices. I elucidate the supposition by analyzing the philosophical poetry of three different women, Marguerite of Navarre from 16th century France and Catherine Phillips and Afra Ben from 17th century England. By analyzing Renaissance women's inventive responses to hermetic philosophy, this paper aims to reintegrate into intellectual history significant strands of early modern intellectual and esoteric culture which have been lost by too exclusive a focus on the masculinist genealogy of knowledge. In his published letters, Marsilio Ficino suggested that the Egyptian hermetic priests practice medicine and the spiritual religious mysteries as one and the same study. Ficino wished to master this natural Egyptian art and encourage others to apply themselves to it. The mysteries of this art can be found in the hermetica. The hermetica posits that plants, stones, and spices have in them a natural power of divinity. It is the human being, according to the Hermetica, who has the capacity to uncover this earthly natural divinity. A human being is a great wonder, the Hermetica tells us. He looks up to heaven, he cultivates the earth, mingling and combining the two natures, mortal and eternal, into one in their just proportions. It is a passage such as this that may have led the 17th century physicians Henry Nolius and Henry Vaughan to observe that Hermetists observe nature in her works, by the mediation of nature, they may produce and bring to light rare effectual medicines. For Nolius and Vaughan, rare effectual medicines could be attained through the distillation, conservation, and transmutation of telluric plants, stones, and spices. 
Hermes was thus regarded as the father of physical and spiritual alchemy. The 17th century German alchemist Martinus Rolandus, for instance, explains that to obtain a knowledge of the mysteries of the art of alchemy, it is necessary to be acquainted with all the works of Hermes. Rolandus goes on to propose that, quote, hermetic philosophers lend themselves readily to interpretations which have no connection with physical chemistry. Under this treatment, the philosopher's stone assumes a purely moral or spiritual significance. For Rolandus, hermetic philosophy does not simply involve physical chemistry, but spiritual chemistry, the alchemy of the soul. It is this blending of the medical, physical, and spiritual that was a key influence on the 16th century French woman writer Marguerite of Navarre. As Frances Yates suggests in her book, The French Academies of the 16th Century, Marguerite of Navarre harbored a cult of Ficinian mysticism at her royal court. Indeed, Marguerite of Navarre acted as patron to Ficinian disciples, such as Lefebvre de Tapla, who in 1514 had brought together the publication of the Hermetica. Marguerite of Navarre was educated with her brother and could read Latin, Italian, Greek, and Hebrew. Marguerite of Navarre thus may have read the Hermetica via Ficino's Latin edition. We only have to turn to Marguerite of Navarre's 1549 manuscript poem, Le Prison, to find a mystical blazon of hermetic medical practice. The flowers, trees, fruits, and stubborn stones, Marguerite writes, and all that is hidden in their secret zones, their virtues and their complex inner folds, their food and what corruption each one holds, and in what way can the other serve, the man who, may, who would their principles observe and reach the perfect knowledge of their aid will learn to keep that man God has made. This same word in Hermes I recognized. Marguerite here cites and celebrates the Hermetica's declaration that earthly herbs, trees, stones, and spices have within themselves a natural force of divinity. Marguerite also vividly emphasizes her own reading of the Hermetica, captured in the phrase, this same word in Hermes I recognized. What is striking about La Prison is Marguerite's construction of a distinctive salvific poetic language that she uses to delineate hermetic medical practice. I would suggest that Marguerite is one of the first French Renaissance writers to create a hermetic poetic language. But Marguerite was an exceptional woman in many ways. She was a royal woman who had an elite education. How could other women access the hermetica and hermetic practices? One way was through their male contemporaries, and we see this through the 17th century Anglo-Welsh writer Catherine Phillips. Catherine Phillips was the daughter of a cloth merchant, but she married a prominent Welsh politician and mixed in the circle of the 17th century alchemist and hermeticist Henry Vaughan. Indeed, in circa 1651, Catherine Phillips chooses to address Henry Vaughan in the following terms. Thou descends from thence like Moses from the mount, and with a candid and unquestioned awe, restore the golden age when verse was law, instructing us that thou securest thy fame, that nothing can disturb it but my name. Nay, I have hopes that standing so near thine, twill lose its dross and by degrees refine. The 17th century alchemical treatise, The All-Wise Doorkeeper, described alchemy as the mosaico-hermetic science of things above and things below. It seems to be this mosaico-hermetic octoritas that Phillips grants to Henry Vaughan's verse, which has the power to restore the golden age and refine Phillips's poetry and name from all its, all its dross, the waste that results from melting metal. As Andrea Brady observes, the golden age that Philip cites in her verse is an allusion to Plato's Republic, when poets were judges, kings, philosophers. However, as Thomas Vaughan, Henry's brother, observes, Platonic, Platonic philosophy descends from Hermes Trismegistus. Pythagoras and Plato had all their learning, ex columnis, mercuri, out of the pillars or hieroglyphical monuments of Trismegistus, Henry Vaughan, um, Thomas Vaughan tells us. Thomas Vaughan here recalls the Renaissance commonplace that Hermes is the father and the prince of all true and loyal philosophers, responsible for a transcultural syncretic theology, a presa theologia. Read within this context, Phillips's invocation of the Golden Age and her panegyric to Henry Vaughan honors not only Plato, but also the pristine presa theologia originating from the golden work of Henry, Hermes Trismegistus. 
Henry Vaughan, as an alchemical philosopher, would not have missed these hermetic nuances. It is not only Henry Vaughan who has the power to separate dross from gold, but also Catherine Phillips's poet speaker herself. This is exhibited in the 1650s devotional lyric, God, where Phillips's speaker undergoes a quest for divine ascent that leads to the discovery of a transmutative theosophical gold. When shall those clogs of sense and fancy break, Phillips writes, that I may hear the God within me speak? When with a silent and retired art shall I with all this empty hurry part to the still voice above my soul advance, my light and joy fixed in God's countenance, which such distinctions all things here behold, and so to separate each dross from gold? John Everard's 1649 English translation of the Hermetica provides two informative contexts for reading these lines. First, the Hermetica intimates that at the dissolution of the material body, man mounts upward through the structure of the heavens. Secondly, the Hermetica posits that this upwards heavenly movement can only be accomplished via a divine silence and rest of all the senses. These, do, these two components, the dissolution of the material body and divine silence, are evoked by Phillips's poem God, where the speaker desires to transcend the physical body, those clogs of sense, and reach the divine through a silent and retired art. Phillips's poem God compounds these two allusions to the Hermetica with a spiritual alchemical idiom, and so to separate each dross from gold, Phillips writes. Dross denotes the waste that res results from melting metal, and gold is, of course, the most precious of all metals. The gold that Phillips' speaker discovers is not an exoteric physical gold, but an inner esoteric gold. What is innovative about the poem God is that Phillips draws upon a hermetic alchemical idiom to voice a politics of gender that advocates divine-inspired androgyny in women. This politics of gender is thrown into relief when we read Phillips's God alongside the writings of two of Phillips's male contemporaries, Thomas Lord Fairfax and Andrew Marvel. In his mid-17th century manuscript commentary on the Hermetica, Lord Fairfax interprets the divine silence of the Hermetica as a prelapsarian silence when God was known, praised, and referenced, reverenced by silence alone. This prelapsarian state of perfection was implicitly denied to women by Lord Fairfax's protege, Andrew Marvel, in his poem, The Garden. Andrew Marvel writes, Such was that happy garden state, while man there walked without a mate, after a place so pure and sweet, to wander solitary there, to paradise's twere in one, to live in paradise alone. Marvel's lines, to paradise's twere in one, to live in paradise alone, recount the Hermetica's delineation of the androgynous character of the creation, man being hermaphrodite or male and female, he is governed by and subjected to a father that is both male and female, the Hermetica tells us. But for Marvel's poet speaker, androgynous Adam does not need a female mate to gain access to a divine retreat. Androgyny for Marvel's poet speaker does not appear to be applicable to Eve and women. For Phillips' speaker in God, however, the silent and retired art is tacitly left open to all sexes and genders. At no point in the poem God does the poet speaker explicitly refer to her or his sex or gender. In this way, Phillips harks back to and celebrates the original androgynous state of creation in the Hermetica. Souls come from one place and they are neither male nor female, the Hermetica tells us. Phillips insinuates in the, in the poem God that sublime hermetic ascent is not just a male androgynous Adamic privilege, but open to all sexless souls. Catherine Phillips' woman-inclusive representation of the hermetic is thrown into further relief when we consider her 1650s friendship poems, which are addressed to women. Here is one example, where Catherine Phillips addresses her friend Anne Owen, whose pseudonym is Lucasia. Lucasia, whose rich soul had it been known in that time the ancients called the Golden One, so that in her that sage his wish had seen, and virtue's self had personated been, now as distilled simples do agree. And in that lembic lose variety, so virtue, though in scattered pieces twas, is by her mind made one rich useful mass. Catherine Phillips' 20th century editor, Patrick Thomas, notes that the sage mentioned here may be the Greek philosopher Aristotle, but the cluster of alchemical imagery, golden one, distilled simples, lembic, and apparatus for distillation, suggests that the sage evoked here is rather the father of medico-religious alchemy, Hermes Trismegistus. 
What Phillips appears to be positing in these lines is that artless materials, al material alchemists distilled simples are searching in vain for an exoteric philosopher's stone, but the spiritual esoteric alchemist Catherine Phillips, who follows the teachings of that sage Hermes Trismegistus, has discovered in Lucasia's virtuous mind one rich useful mass that can be utilized for inner mental spiritual transformation and illumination. According to the OED, mass in this context has an alchemical nuance. It refers to metal, especially gold and silver, and may be a synonym for the philosopher's stone, the panacea for all diseases. For Catherine Phillips, this alchemistical curative, curative mass emanates from Lucasia's mind, and readers of John Everard's English translation of the Hermetica will know that the quest for eternal health and immortality begins by understanding the divine mind, Nu. And let him that is endued with mind know himself to be immortal. Everard writes, but first well conceive the light in thy mind and know it. For Catherine Phillips, divine health and immortality can only be dispensed by Lucasia's rich soul and mind. What is striking about Phillips' pursuit of the golden one, the philosopher's stone, is the challenge that Catherine Phillips channels towards John Donne's famous poem, Love's Alchemy. Dunn's speaker had announced in Love's Alchemy, hope not for mind in women. Finding a mind in a woman for Dunn's speaker and Love's Alchemy is an impossibility, just like the impossibility of acquiring the Philosopher's Stone. And as no chemic yet the elixir got, John Dunn writes. Phillips' speaker in the poem Lucasia, however, questions this misogynistic assumption by implying that it is precisely through Lucasia's mind that the Philosopher's Stone can be attained. Distilled simples such as Dunn's speaker and love's alchemy may shun the female mind, but refined hermetic alchemists such as Catherine Phillips know that the female intellectual capacity can be utilized for a powerful and transformative productivity by her mind made one rich useful mass, Catherine Phillips writes. One 17th century woman who read Catherine Phillips's hermetic alchemical poems was Aphra Ben. Afro Ben in circa 1676 writes the following. Let me bend with Sappho and Orinda be, O ever sacred nymph adorned by thee, and give me verses immortality. Ben here aspires to belong to a sacred female poetic tradition that is initiated by Sappho and upheld by Orinda, which is Catherine Phillips's literary pseudonym. Ben, like Phillips, writes friendship poetry to women, but Ben uses Hermes Trismegistus as a hermaphroditic and erotic muse. Here is one of Ben's poems. To the fair Clorinda, who made love to me, imagined more than woman. When ere the manly part of thee would plead, thou tempts us with the image of the maid, while we the noblest passions do extend, the love to Hermes, Aphrodite, the friend. The Hermes that Ben cites here refers to the Greek god Hermes, who with Venus produced hermaphroditus. But Clorinda's alluring Hermes-like androgyny here also in part stems from John Everard's translation of the Hermetica. Everard writes, man being hermaphrodite or male and female, he is governed by and subjected to a father that is both male and female. Hermes Trismegistus was depicted by some early modern thinkers as a bisexual figure who balanced soul and lunar, sun and moon, male and female. It seems to be this shape-shifting androgynous alchemical quality that is embodied by Ben Speaker's lover, Clorinda, as she is a lovely maid who simultaneously reveals and conceals the manly part. What is striking about Ben's use of hermetic androgyny is that she applies it to female friendship and eroticism. In circa 1650, Catherine Phillips had written, Friendships a Science. What does science mean here? As Francis Yates has shown, one crucial strand of early modern scientific discourse stemmed from hermeticism and hermetic alchemy. As the 17th century treatise The Always Doorkeeper reminds us, alchemy is the mosaic hermetic science of things above and things below. I have tried to show today that the writings of early modern women are crucial for understanding what we mean by spiritual, medical, hermetic science. 16th century women writers such as Marguerite of Navarre Navar, engaged with the definitions of hermetic medical science, and Marguerite of Navarre was one of the first French writers to construct a poetic language to explore hermetic ideas. 
Moreover, 17th century English women, such as Catherine Phillips and Afra Ban, innovatively reappropriated hermetic science and applied it to female friendship, spirituality, eroticism, and healing. 